June 6, 1944, D-Day. Canadian Sherman tanks and infantry land on Juneau Beach in Normandy under murderous fire. There was so bloody much tanks burning that we were just in a bloody jungle. You saw one of your tanks in front of you hit. You didn't know what was happening. You kept going, you kept going. The Canadians overwhelm the Germans' coastal defenses and advance inland. I thought, wow, <laughs> this is a breeze. We'll be on our way to Berlin next week. Only to come turret to turret with the most ruthless killers in the German army. The Panzers with the battle-hardened SS. There was really no need to fear Sherman. They were easy opponents for us. This is armored warfare at its bloodiest, the Battle of Normandy. Finally, I said, fire. Juno Beach. Eight kilometers of gently sloping shoreline along the coast of Normandy. In the late spring of 1944, this was one of the beaches where the greatest amphibious operation in history took place. The Allies' all-out attack on Hitler's Atlantic Wall. the fall of France in 1940, the Germans have been preparing for the inevitable Allied invasion. Building a 5,000 kilometer chain of fortifications stretching from Norway to the Spanish border. This Atlantic wall is considered impregnable with kilometers of concrete bunkers, tens of thousands of mines and anti-tank obstacles, and protected by over 3,000 big guns. This impressive defensive line seems the most unlikely place for an attack, but on June 6, 1944, that's exactly what the Allies do. At 0300 hours, a force tens of thousands of men strong approaches the Norman coast and unleashes a massive naval bombardment. All of a sudden, they started firing. There was a British cruiser right behind us, and these six-inch guns fired right over our heads. And my God, a six-inch gun when it fires. I sure got my back like a window blind. <laughs> Scared the hell of them. You could see it falling on the, on the towns and way up in front of you and pounding all over the place. Operation Overlord is a joint Allied attack, and the Canadian objective is eight kilometers of heavily defended coast, codenamed Juno Beach. Leading the assault is the 2nd Canadian Armored Brigade. Their mission, neutralize the German defenses and secure a beachhead for the infantry. At 0800 hours, the Canadians launch their attack, and leading the way are scores of amphibious tanks. They gave us all the basic training of, of, of preserving a tank in the water. We did the drill. Let the water come up and so on. Don't get panicked. First man that gets out is the driver. Stands on the back after you've got to steer this bloody thing, see? The DD, or swimming tank, has a sealed lower hull to keep it from sinking, and it gains extra buoyancy from high canvas skirts. But its most unique feature is its duplex drive, twin propellers that push it along at a speed of almost four knots. The DD is an ungainly 30-ton monster and is slow and hard to maneuver in rough seas. The skipper said, okay, we're going on the run-in, be prepared, and in we went. 
And of course, it's an awkward bloody thing to steer because it doesn't work very well in the tide and the wind, and it was an, an awfully rough day. The five kilometer run into Juneau Beach is harrowing and lethal. High waves sink the tanks, as do underwater mines. As they near shore, they come within range of the Germans' well-placed guns. Of the 67 tanks launched from the landing craft, 11 never reached shore. The do have to lower the canvas skirts under heavy fire before bringing their guns into action. There was confusion. It looked like chaos. And there were a lot of vehicles, but they were all moving uh, as they were supposed to. During the first hours of the battle, the Canadians lose hundreds of men and 19 tanks. I saw Canadians lying on the beach, some of them with stuff thrown over them. Despite their losses, they overrun the German defenses and take Juneau Beach. By the end of D-Day, the Allies have breached Hitler's Atlantic Wall along 80 kilometers of Normandy coastline and have begun their advance inland. Their strategy is to encircle and destroy the German forces in occupied France. The Americans are to swing west while British and Canadian forces head south toward their next objective, the strategically important city of Caen. But scarcely have the tanks of the 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade rolled off the beach when they encounter a new kind of peril, the picturesque Normandy landscape. It's a maze of narrow fields, five-meter-high hedgerows, and sunken lanes, a tanker's nightmare. Maneuvering a tank through this is difficult and dangerous. This is nothing like the wide open desert of North Africa or the steppes on the Eastern Front. In Normandy, the fighting is at close range, making surprise absolutely vital. The, the first idea you get is for Christ's sake, get out in the field and start moving. Suddenly, you're up against the Normandy hedge, which is 14 feet high. It's on a two-foot high bank. You go crashing through it. And you go down into a sunken road four feet deep. You go across the road and you're into another Normandy hedge. Very difficult to get into and very difficult to get out of. And you can get hung up in the edge and you're totally vulnerable at that point. But if you don't have a plan, you get you get nailed. Because the enemy always has a plan. D-Day plus one. Despite the difficult terrain, Canadian tankers of the 2nd Armored Brigade make steady progress towards Caen. And as the battle enters its second day, they encounter a column of nine German Panther tanks. The Panther is considered one of the best tanks in the Second World War. 
His long-barreled 75-millimeter cannon is deadly, even at long range. It's protected by 80 millimeters of frontal armor, welded at a steep 50-degree slope, making it almost invulnerable to frontal attack. The Panther was, and this was pretty well known, the most functional and best tank in the war, based on three components. Gun velocity, cross-country mobility, and armored protection. But those advantages won't help these Panthers. Their frontal armor won't do them any good. They're side on to the Shermans and highly exposed. The Sherman has a short-barreled, less powerful 75-millimeter gun and thinner 51-millimeter armor plating, making it vulnerable in a head-on battle with the Panther, but deadly at close range if they catch the Germans off guard. For wireless operator Phil Lawrence and the other rookies of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, this will be their first head-to-head -head encounter with the enemy. We heard from the infantry that there were some Panther tanks coming. The, the tanks were fairly close. They're about 900 yards, 1,000 yards away. And uh, meanwhile, I'm trying to wake up my gun. The captain got us all lined up. Each of us was given a target. And I'm kicking his legs to try to get some life into him. By this time, the order to fire has been given. And uh, my gunner is fast asleep. June 6, 1944, D-Day. Canadian tanks and infantry land at Juneau Beach in Normandy under intense fire. They take heavy losses, but overrun German defenses and move inland. The Allied plan is to encircle and destroy the German forces in Normandy with the Americans swinging west, while British and Canadian forces push south towards the strategically important city of Caen. Leading the Canadian advance are the tanks of the 2nd Canadian Armored Brigade. A few kilometers inland, they encounter a column of German Panther tanks. The, the tanks were fairly close. They're about 900 yards, 1,000 yards away. By this time, the order to fire has been given, and my gunner is fast asleep. It's very scary. And the crew commander is batting him with his, his head with his hands to wake him up. He said to the gunner, you, you useless son of a bitch, you are now the crew co-driver trying to get in there and don't get in anybody's way. <laughs> and finally, he traversed around and fired. You know, the, the tank was up on its uh, springs and the gun recoils and runs out and the turret fills up with fire and smoke, makes a tremendous row. It's very scary. It wasn't so much a battle as it was an ambush. Those poor buggers never knew what hit them. I mean, one minute they're riding along, one behind the other, and the next minute, you know, everything's on fire. They fought them in a way that we thought was kind of stupid. They used to sit side on. The Panther has just 50 millimeters of side armor, about half as much as it has in front. Head on, a Panther can withstand almost any Allied attack, 
but catch it side on and at close range, and it's very vulnerable. He could knock them off easily. All nine Panthers were knocked out like that. I thought, wow, <laughs> this is a breeze. This is a great, I like this. We'll be on our way to Berlin next week. But the Canadians are about to get a surprise of their own. Rushing to meet them with orders from the German high command to stop the Allied advance are units of the newly formed 12th SS Panzer Division, led by some of Hitler's most experienced tank commanders. The 12th SS is equipped with 48 Panthers, dozens of heavy guns, almost 100 Panzer IVs. The SS were a rough lot, but they were very good at what they did. If you make a mistake, they'll kill you. We knew that it was our duty as soldiers of the German Wehrmacht to serve whether we thought it would be successful or not. This was none of our business. The 12th SS, also known as the Hitler Youth Division, is led by Kurt Meyer, a decorated veteran of the Eastern Front, with a reputation as an aggressive and ruthless tank commander. His troops call him Panzermeyer. Battalion after battalion arrived. The soldiers waved at me. They were moving forward to their baptism of fire in a calm manner. They showed no self-pity. They were determined to prove themselves. D-Day plus one. Kurt Meyer and his panzers take up positions in the historic 12th century Abbe d'Arden. There in the monastery gardens, the 12th SS Panzer Division lies in wait for the tanks of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, who are supporting the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, slowly advancing en route to Caen. From high atop the Abbey Tower, Kurt Meyer can see them coming. He climbed up the tower of the Ardennes Church. The Abbey is 67 meters above sea level. The church itself is 26 meters high. He was able to see all the way to the western end of Juno Beach. The terrain as far as the coast was spread before me like a sand dune. The whole expanse looked like an anthill. He noticed the Canadian troops advancing. I then saw what was happening. My God, what an opportunity. I issued orders to all battalions, the artillery and the tanks. Fire on my command only. The squadron stopped. They had snacks. They ate. The Canadians had no protection of their flank. Sur leur flanc. The tanks were right across the front of our regiment. The barrels of our guns were pointing at them. Then I gave the signal for the attack. All of a sudden, bang. There was so bloody much smoke and tanks burning. 
that, that they were just in a bloody jungle. D-Day plus one. Over the last 36 hours, the Canadian 2nd Armoured Brigade has broken out from their Normandy beachhead and begun to battle their way inland. Rushing to meet them are tanks of the 12th SS Panzer Division, led by the infamous Kurt Meyer. His forces take up position in the Abbe d'Ardenne. There, the 12th SS set a trap for the tanks of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, now slowly advancing toward the city of Caen. All of a sudden, bang. From then on, the battle started. smoke and dust and tanks burning that, that they were just in a bloody jungle. The Canadians are caught by surprise. Within seconds, the lead tanks of the Fusiliers' column are destroyed. Our commanding officer needs some more strength forward, and he asked my uh, squadron commander to send up a troop of tanks, four tanks. And he asked for another troop. So now, there's my squadron commander, myself, and uh, the third tank, and that's all we got. And then the message comes from him saying, the Germans are breaking through on your left move over to your left. And he still thought we had a squadron, I guess. All of a sudden, the uh, action started to move around our way. And at first, I saw the tanks, and uh, they were at about, oh, a thousand yards away. Oh, <laughs> each one of us, you know, you had the jitters every time you saw the buggers because the gun was so much superior. The Panzer IV carries a powerful 75 millimeter cannon. And although it has a shorter barrel than the Panther, a shell from a Panzer IV can still rip through the weak armor of a Sherman tank. The Sherman was an easy opponent for us. If you were able to keep your distance, then there was no need to fear a Sherman. The short-barreled Sherman doesn't have nearly as much punch as the Panzer IV. You have to start playing the game of tactics. And I start firing my smoke in front of it. Along with high explosive and armor-piercing rounds, the Sherman is also equipped with white phosphorus incendiaries. These shells can be used by tankers to mark enemy targets or fire to create smoke screens to provide tactical cover. And uh, they were at about, oh, a thousand yards away. And I said, Christy, let them come in close and watch the right-hand corner where I just put down the smoke, because you may see something coming around the corner there, taking a look at us. And sure enough, you see a tank just sticking his nose around, looking, trying to get some, some view. Finally, I said, fire. And I hit him at a boat. Oh, it must have been in eight or nine hundred yards, I guess. I can always remember the thing actually burning.
It's Radley Walter's first tank kill. By war's end, he will have 17 more and recognition as Canada's leading tank ace. But on this day, the Canadians take a beating. They lose 28 tanks, 110 men killed, and 128 taken prisoner. 18 of the captured are delivered to a terrible fate. Le premier groupe. The first group, which was mostly the North Nova Scotia's, were brought to this courtyard here. These Canadian soldiers would have come up these stairs and into this park. They came along here. At the top of the stairs, there was an SS. who would kill each one with a bullet in the back of the neck. The ruthless Kurt Meyer and his 12th SS Panzer Division have all but stopped the Canadians in their tracks. All along the northern front, the Allied advance slows to a crawl. The British and Canadians planned to take the city of Caen in three days, but it takes them 34. The fighting is the bloodiest they have yet seen. To break the German stubborn resistance, the Allies take drastic action and send in heavy bombers. Massive daily air raids reduce much of the ancient Norman city to rubble. What happened was that Khan City was totally obliterated. On July 9th, D-Day plus 33, the Allies finally enter Khan. Our tank advanced down one of the main streets of Khan only to find that uh, we were driving into huge multiple bomb craters. Some of them were so big that the Sherman tank, which is 11 feet high, was actually going down underground. On one occasion, we came to a total stop, and I got up on the top of the tank, and I couldn't see where would be the normal ground level. There's rubble everywhere, but no Germans. They've withdrawn, leaving the ruined city to the Allies, who become bogged down in the wreckage created by their own bombs. The Germans have retreated south of Caen, digging in along a five-kilometer stretch of high ground known as Verrier Ridge. The ridge rises 30 meters above the lowlands, making it an ideal defensive position for the Germans. From here, they can command the area all the way north to Caen, making it a killing ground for the advancing Allied armor. The Germans deploy their arsenal, including 72 88 millimeter anti-tank guns, 40 Panthers, and 80 heavy Tiger tanks. Even though they are facing one of the most formidable defensive positions in Normandy, on July 18th, nine days after entering Caen, British and Canadian forces launch Operation Goodwood, an armored assault aimed directly at the Germans on Verrier Ridge. 
And once again, the tankers of the 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade are in the thick of it. Their orders? Take and hold the small Norman village at the foot of the ridge. I remember being in a place called St. Andre Soror. They had reported that there were 64 German tanks in St. Andre. We said, well, uh, that, that means there's probably eight tanks. We tend to divide about eight, one-eighth of what they reported. So we thought to be safe to send in 12. It was raining and we couldn't see very well. Very hard to make anything out. We got in there and by God, there were 64. There were tanks everywhere. After 34 days of fierce fighting, battered British and Canadian forces finally enter the heavily bombed Norman city of Caen. Nine days later, they are ready to continue their advance and link up with US forces routing the German army in southern France. But German forces in the north are far from defeated. Eight kilometers south of Caen, they dig in along Verrier Ridge with masses of anti-tank guns and hundreds of tanks. The ridge is now one of the strongest defensive positions in France. July 18, 1944. Combined British and Canadian forces launch Operation Goodwood, aimed at driving the Germans off the ridge. On the western flank of the attack are the tankers of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, with orders to seize and hold the village of saint andre sur orne They had reported that there were 64 German tanks in saint andre We said, well, uh, that, that means there's probably eight tanks. We got in there, and by God, there were 64. There were tanks everywhere. And we couldn't get organized to take them on. And there was a lot of people getting knocked out. It was raining, and you couldn't see very well. Very hard to make anything out. We seemed to have lost touch with everybody. We decided we'd better try to find a, a safe position and some targets. We found an excellent position. It was a stone building on the right. So we were covered from view and from fire from the right. You could hardly see us for this hedge. There were nine Panthers out above a thousand yards or so, side on. I had taken one last look out, out of the turret because I'm still having trouble with the, the mist and rain and whatnot. And a Tiger tank came around the corner of the building, saw the position, thought, that's a great position. And they pulled in and stopped right in front of us. It was just the scariest damned apparition I've ever seen. Just bloomed up like that. We were almost touching on there. So I had an AP up to his boat. I fired that and hit him, and it just bounced off. And after that, we just fired a high explosive as fast as we could. About that fast. I was literally just holding the firing button down. The gun was firing, recoiling, running out, firing, recoiling, running out. And my loader operator was fleeing the shells in. 
and then he fired back. The Tiger weighs 57 tons, almost twice as much as a Sherman. It has 100 millimeters of frontal armor, making it almost impregnable. It carries an 88 millimeter gun that can destroy a Sherman more than two kilometers away. And this Tiger is practically on top of Lawrence's tank. There are no words that can convey the incredible violence of that strike. The AP shell that hit our turret, it looked as if someone had taken a uh, torch and just burned the channel front to back. You know, driving reverse, hard right. And our co-driver was driving. He wasn't a very good driver. And he went to go into reverse. He revved up the engine. The real driver grabbed the hand throttles. And then he just grabbed the gear shift lever and rammed it into reverse. And he yelled into the face of the co-driver, let out that clutch and get the hell out of here. And so we went shooting back. Sherbrooke Fusiliers lose half their tanks and are forced to retreat. Other units suffer similar losses and pull back. Operation Goodwood is a disaster. The British sent 800 tanks across that open ground just south of Khan, and 400 of them were knocked out. The Germans were up on the Bourguibus Ferrier Ridge and were able to see for miles and miles. And along those miles, the Germans were entrenched in farmhouses, hidden away with their big guns. Able to see everything that moved, able to cover the whole area with their 88 millimeter, their famous anti-tank guns which were anti-aircraft guns, supposed to fire at aircraft 20,000 feet up in the air, but firing at us 200 yards away. On the 21st, the offensive against Verrier Ridge is called off as the enormity of the losses sinks in. In just four days, the Allies lose over 6,000 men and more than 300 tanks and the Germans still remain firmly in control of the ridge. Now, our task was to go up that hill and find a way in which we could get through those German lines, which are now reported to be possibly one of the strongest defenses that the Germans set up anywhere in World War II. The Allies are desperate for a breakthrough. Canadian Lieutenant General Guy Simmons comes up with a bold and risky plan to take the ridge. Codenamed Operation Totalize, Simmons' plan calls for 400 tanks to quickly advance in six columns straight into the German defensive positions. And to reduce the effect of the German big guns, he will launch the attack at night. If one asks, what did one see? The simple answer is nothing. July 21st, 1944. After taking enormous casualties, four days of bloody fighting, the Allies canceled their massive armored offensive aimed at eliminating the stubborn German defenses along Verrier Ridge. Lieutenant General Guy Simmons comes up with a new plan. The Allies must take the ridge because a breakthrough is key to the overall campaign in Normandy. Codenamed Operation Totalize, it calls for 400 tanks supported by infantry to rush forward in six columns headlong into the German guns. To reduce the effect of the guns, 
Simmons plans to strike under the cover of darkness. A nocturnal armored operation on this scale has never been tried before. So Simmons orders his infantry and tanks to practice the attack in daylight over and over again. Getting ready for Totalize was basically a, about a week of really studying how to put it together. They put one, two, three, four. They made up four columns. Behind those four tanks, they put four more. Behind that, they put four flails. Behind that, another four flails. And then four companies of infantry in armored personnel carriers. Uh, everything tracked, not one wheel vehicle at all. 11.30 hours, August 8th. After a massive bombardment, Operation Totalize begins. 400 British and Canadian tanks lurch forward into the darkness. So you were uh, in a, a mixture of uh, sentiments. You were afraid, you were proud, you were thrilled. Uh, you were bewildered. The tanks stay close together, crawling slowly toward the ridge, following lines of tracer fire that point the way to each unit's objective. And all you saw was the red tail light of a tank in front. So you fixed your eyes on that red tail light and you followed for your life's sake. And the buggers would be putting in mines knowing reasonably well where we were and which way we might come out against them. Total chaos with flashes going on all over the place, uh, shells exploding. Hear the shooting going on all over the damn place. On the way, you saw some Germans in slit trenches, but you've been told not to stop, to keep going. You saw one of your tanks in front of you hit. And going up in flames, you saw another one hit, going up in flames. You didn't know what was happening. You kept going, you kept going. On August 8th, Canadian and British forces have captured most of Verrier Ridge. By noon, the entire position is in Allied hands. Phase one of Operation Totalize is a success, opening the way for the Allies to advance and hook up with U.S. forces further south. On August 21st, after two more weeks of fierce fighting, the Allies finally complete their encirclement of the German army in Normandy. Those Germans who remain trapped inside the pocket are now easy prey for the Allies' superior air power. And uh, for a while, this tremendous slaughter, you can only call it, went on. More and more bombers and fighter bombers attacked. The misery around us screamed to high heaven. Refugees and soldiers from the defeated German armies looked helplessly at the bombers flying continuously overhead. It was useless to take cover from the bursting shells and bombs. Concentrated in such a confined space, we offered once-in-a-lifetime targets to the enemy air power. Death shadowed us at every step. We stood out like targets on a range. It was impossible to miss us. The destruction of the German army in France marks the end of the Battle of Normandy. German losses are horrific. 200,000 are killed or wounded, and 1,300 tanks are destroyed. 
Normandy has become a graveyard for the once mighty German panzers. Of the 12th SS Panzer Division, only 10 tanks and 300 men are reported to have escaped, including Kurt Meyer, who was later put on trial for war crimes, including the killing of 18 Canadian prisoners at the Abbe Dardenne. But he spends just nine years in prison. For the Allies, the Battle of Normandy is a great victory, but it comes at a steep price. 50,000 men are killed, and over 150,000 are wounded. In the Battle of Normandy, the Cherbourg Fusiliers suffer some of the heaviest losses of the war. Many still wonder how they survived. You know, I've been in tanks who were knocked out, but the shell didn't hit where I was. I've been in mortar uh, barrages, but no mortar came down where I was. It's just dumb luck. Um, I think everybody would agree on that. You, you've got to be skillful, you've got to be thoughtful and careful and all of that. But if you're not lucky, you're not going to make it.